I want to ask you a question today. Are you very conscious of your sins? Do you think about your sins a lot? Is it on the forefront of your mind? Do you concern yourself with your sin? You know, the King David, back in Psalm 51, he said this, For I acknowledge my sin, or I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. The sin that I committed is always in front of me. It's always there. I recognize what I've done. I know that I have failed. I know that I have done evil, and I can't get it off of my mind. And so many people think that that's the godly way to live, that that's the New Testament Christian way to function. Think about your sin. Be concerned about your sin. Try harder to repent of your sin. Be conscious, conscious, conscious of your sin. But if you look at the book of Hebrews, he actually says something that flies in the face of that completely. He says this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2, that they would have no more conscience of sins. So he says that in the Old Testament law, they would make sacrifices repeatedly for sins. Day after day, the priest was standing continuously, daily, ministering and offering the same sacrifices repeatedly over and over and over again because the the sin was actually not fully removed and but now he says for the law having a shadow of good things to come so under the old testament law they would have a day or two or maybe weeks of reprieve where they would offer one sacrifice on the day of of uh atonement the day of atonement they would offer this one sacrifice the high priest would go into the most holy place with his offering and he would offer his sacrifice before the lord there and all of the jews would then celebrate that their sins had been removed he would take off his outer garb and he would go into the most holy place never never without blood always going in there cautiously carefully he would offer the sacrifice for sins of the people and he would come back out and then the people would celebrate that their sins were removed but he says that's just a shadow of good things to come because really the next day the priest was standing yet again he could never have a seat he could never take a rest day after day after day it was as if there was one priest just continuing on and on and on really there was many priests taking turns and they would just come in on shifts and keep working and offering sacrifice for this guy and then for that girl and for this boy and for that young man they would just keep offering and offering and offering so there was this consciousness of sins continuously over and over and over again they could never rest they could never relax they could never say it's okay I don't need to think about my sins anymore. He says the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So he's contrasting something. He's beginning to show us that there's a difference now. Back in those days, the, the worshipers, those that were offering sacrifices, the comers thereunto, could never be made perfect because their sins could not be removed by the, by the blood of bulls and of goats and of ashes, of sprinkling of, of blood and so on and so forth. It could never happen. They could never make the comers thereunto perfect. What's he saying? If back then the, con the comers thereunto could not be made perfect, is he saying something about us now that maybe perhaps we can be made perfect? For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Hebrews chapter 10 verse 2. Because that the worshipers once purged, if they were once fully purged, then should they have had no more conscience of sins. Do you see that? If those worshipers back then under the Old Covenant could have offered the perfect lamb, meaning all their sins were once and for all paid for, then would they not have ceased to offer those sacrifices? And would they not then finally have had a relief of their conscience knowing that, hey, do you know what? It's okay. All of my sins are covered. They're all paid for. But they couldn't. They continued coming. But in those sacrifices, it says, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Look it up. Hebrews chapter 10, 3. Every year they kept making a same remembrance of their sins again and again and again, remembering their sins. 
For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Therefore, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Some people think that the pleasure that God takes in us is in us constantly offering sacrifices for sins. They think that that's what God is most pleased in. If you have a constant broken heart and are constantly conscious of your sins, then that means you're humble, that means you're holy, that means you're godly. How do you deal with those sins? You make sacrifices. Most of you don't ever offer a blood sacrifice, but you offer some other sacrifice hoping that God will perhaps have mercy upon your souls. What do you offer? Church service? Giving money or tithes? Perhaps you get baptized? Maybe you pray really hard? Maybe you fast some? I don't know what you do to offer sin, sacrifice for sins, but back then they did what was required. They offered blood. And he says it could never take away their sins. They could never actually get rid of what was, all, what was burdening them. And he says God never had pleasure in those sacrifices. And so can you imagine God obviously has no pleasure in whatever sacrifices we might offer? Because back then they were looking forward to the sacrifice of Christ. We are now looking back on the one true sacrifice for sins. And yet sometimes we still offer sacrifices repeatedly. And then he says this, then said he, in verse 9, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. He took away that first covenant that he had made with the Jews, so that he could establish a second. What is this second all about? By the which will, this new, sec, this new covenant, by the which will, the, which, the covenant, the testament that he made, we are sanctified through the body of the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Not repeatedly. Jesus is not standing continuously, daily, offering sacrifices, not year by year. He did one offering of Jesus Christ once for all. And he says this again in verse 11. Every priest under the old covenant standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. I've already shared this, but this is exactly what the Bible says. Those priests stand daily ministering, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices. But this man, Jesus, after he have offered one sacrifice for sins forever, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, what did he do? He sat down. He sat down on the right hand of God. You know, the priests didn't ever sit. There was a table in the, in the tabernacle. There was the showbread. There was the lampstand. There was the big altar. There was the basin where they washed. But there were no chairs. There was no place to sit. I love how Andrew Farley talks about this. He says, if, imagine if you had taken your little lamb and you had this, this sin on your conscience and you needed to deal with your conscience and with your sin, you would take this sweet little lamb that you had raised separate from the rest of the flock, all perfect lamb without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, and you would bring it over. You would bring it to um, without spot or blemish or any such thing. You would bring it to the tabernacle and there you would bring it in, maybe holding it, caressing it, knowing that this is the only way your sins can be removed. And you enter into the tabernacle and you see the priest sitting on a, lo on a lounge chair with his feet propped up. You would say, no, 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 what are you doing? <clears throat> the sins have not yet all been paid for. Don't sit down. Keep working, please. I need this sin forgiven as well. But now, if you go into the most holy place, the true tabernacle in heaven, not made with hands, you'll see the Lord Jesus, our great high priest, and the offering for sins sitting at the right hand of God. Because he did the work, it's all done. There's no more need for constant repetition and sacrifice and remembrance of sins repeatedly again and again and again. Obviously, obviously, if we sin, we confess it to our friends, to our family, to whoever we've hurt. But we cannot, and I don't think we should go before God and say, God, oh, please forgive. I'm such a miserable sinner. My sin is ever before me. We should rather say, Lord, thank you 
thank you that you have dealt with this sin also. I confess that I have failed you yet again, but I'm thankful that you have already made provision for my sins. It, when it says that we have no more conscience of sin, it doesn't mean that we are callous toward our sin or that we just say, ah, whatever, I sin, no big deal, Jesus already paid for it. No, we just don't have it weighing on our conscience constantly. We don't have to go to bed wondering and tweeveling and trying to worry about and thinking about our sins because we can go to God immediately and say, Lord, I recognize my sin and I thank you that you have already made provision for this sin also. And I thank you that you didn't have to stand back up when I made this, this terrible decision. I'm thankful that you are not somehow now preparing yourself for another sacrifice, that there was one sacrifice made forever. And I thank you, Lord, for dealing with my sins. That's actually a much more humbling experience. It's kind of easy to go to God and say, God, please, I'm miserable, I'm wretched, I'm evil, please forgive me. Because it feels like we're doing something. It feels like we're showing God the vulnerability of our soul. We're showing God our sincerity and our dedication. We're trying desperately to what? To appease Him. It's a sacrifice in and of itself, that confession. But if we go to Him and say, God, thank you. That's an act of faith. I'm not showing Him anything. I'm not showing Him a dedicated soul. I'm not showing Him sincerity. I'm showing Him the one true sacrifice that actually matters. I'm showing him and I'm reminding him, Father, look, you made a sacrifice for this sin and I thank you that you have already put away my sins. He made one sacrifice for sins forever and he sat down from henceforth expecting till all his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, remember I said before, the comers thereunto could never be made perfect. Now he says this, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. I want to tell you today, folks, you have been made perfect through the sacrifice of Christ. There is no more need for sacrifices for your sins. One sacrifice for sins forever, and he sat down. Praise God for it. Bless him for it. Worship him for it. Thank him for it. 